I'd like a word with all of you that consider yourself to be leaders. Hello again everyone, I'm Eli's dad with Project Eli, where we educate, lead, and inspire. And you know, Eli, 70%, according to statistics, 70% of the workforce is dissatisfied at their jobs. I think that's kind of an important thing to examine, don't you? That's what we're going to do today. So please join Eli and me as we discuss why leaders should lead correctly. All right, first of all, let's start with one of my basic premises. There have been nine zillion books and eight million videos on leadership. Can I make it simple for you? Let me tell you what leadership is. Leadership is exercising the success formula to a group of people. It's a science. The success formula is a science. When you can take that science and get a group of people to comply with it, you're going to get your job done. You're going to get the outcome that you deserve and desire. So that's what our focus is going to be on. And I'm going to show you that today. And the way I'm going to show you that is by using a lot of V words. So pay attention. This is going to be easy and you're going to see my points here. All right. First of all, the first thing we need to understand is that leaders lead. Leaders lead and they lead by example. Key point. And if you're going to lead on a particular philosophy, outcome, burning desire, magnificent obsession, here's a quote from Niccolo Paganini that I'm going to start with and it goes something like this and I quote, in order to move others, I must be moved. So if you don't feel it in here, if there's not a sincere, authentic feeling inside, people spot a phony like it's a $3 bill and you're not going to lead very much at all. So let's keep that in mind. All right, let's get to the success formula as an individual and how that should be incorporated into your team play. Now the first thing that we want to talk about is having, the first V, is having the vision. Now how you arrive at the vision, there's many ways to arrive at the vision and I've done a video on that, arriving at the vision. I have a whole series on leadership. Part of it is how to arrive at the vision, whether it's it comes from the top down or from the bottom up or a combination of both. The point is the vision has to be crystal clear it has the objective has to be clearly understood by not only the leadership but by the masses once again the success formula translating it to the masses if the masses don't see if the if the if the workforce does not clearly see the vision they're a boat without a rudder they don't know where they're going they're just out there they're just working they're just working for a paycheck when people have a vision they work harder than just working for a paycheck. Number two, the second V, there has to be a virtue of the vision, also known as the why and because. Why is it important? What's the purpose? What are we going to accomplish? Just as you as an individual in the success formula have to focus on your why, the team has to focus on the why. Why is it important? What when people work at a particular factory or warehouse or laboratory or whatever they do, every single job is important. If everyone in the building understands this is what we're going for, then the person in the quote unquote lowest position possible, the person that's sweeping up at the end of the night says, I need to sweep up and do a good job. So my part of the job is when these people come in, they're ready to rock and roll. My job is important. Everybody has to understand the why. They have to understand the virtue of the vision. And when they do, when they embrace it, then everyone on the team locks arms, works together, and they're willing to do so. When you have a specific objective and a definite why and everyone gets it, it locks people together. It's a bonding element. All right, the next thing, number three, viable stretch of the comfort zone. All right, so how do you achieve things? All right, when you are an individual 
and you are looking to achieve, your focus should always be just to get a little bit out of your comfort zone, to have your grasp exceed your reach by just a little bit. There needs to be that kind of a challenge. It has to be something that's quote unquote believable, that's achievable, but your person has to look at it as a challenge. So what is today's challenge? It has to be clear, concise, and definite. This is the challenge. And then, and only then, when it is achieved, then there is a feeling of accomplishment that you're taking a step forward and reaching the why of the vision, the purpose. So there has to be a stretch, a viable stretch, something that can be seen, something that can be envisioned as my project today in terms of my small focus today, in terms of achieving the big goal, you want to stretch people just a little bit outside of their comfort zone so that they can conceive, believe, and achieve that they can get that job done. Which brings us to number four. You have to view it every day from a small focus to an essential part of the whole. Sometimes there are functions, jobs, activities that take place that people look upon as busy work. That mindset has to change. Now as an individual, how do you change that? Well, you have, if you're following the success formula, quiet thinking time every single day and you visualize the end result, the final outcome. Now keep in mind that the success formula is a science, just like gravity is a science, all right? If I drop something, it's gonna always fall down. Why? Science tells us it's going to. The, lo the laws of success work exactly the same way. So my point here is whether people are performing the laws of success consciously or unconsciously, as long as they are performing them, they will achieve that success. So your job as the leader is to get them to perform the functions according to the law. The people performing them don't have to understand the why and because the law works. Just as I don't understand how a car engine works, I do understand if I turn the key and put my foot on the gas, I'm going places. I understand that. Get your people to put the key in the lock and put their foot on the gas. And when you are doing this, remember, quiet thinking time. So what do you do as an individual? You sit, you think, you visualize. Well, you can't sit there and make your people say, hey, stop, think. What do you do instead? Very simple. You put up pictures, you put up posters, you put up sayings. You put it in their face every single day what the end result is that you want to achieve. If you do that, you cannot help but be focused on that if you're seeing it every time you turn around. And if there's something new, a new saying, announce it over the loudspeaker system. Put up little banners and doorways so that people see them. Have thoughts for the day. Do things like that. And when you do that, you know what you're gonna find? Not only are you gonna do that, but then the people in the work area are going to start to do that as well. How about that? And when that happens, you say to yourself, my goodness, I'm almost there. That's where I want to be. You want to get the team focused. These are the things that you do as an individual. You have your quiet thinking time. Well, you can't force people to have quiet thinking time, but you can put the stuff in front of them. That science will work because when they see it, then they will start thinking about it. They will start envisioning it. They will, on their way home, going in their car from, to and from work, they will say, hey, I got an idea that's related to... That's how things advance. They advance like that as an individual. They advance as a team. Okay, number five. Verbiage, encouragement, and feedback. It is so critical to give feedback all the time. As a matter of fact, what got me started on this particular subject 
was I was talking to somebody about the workplace and they were saying, you know, the only time management ever says something to us is when we do something wrong. And they're looking to put like another set of handcuffs on us, you know, a new camera, a new something where they're watching us. And we've had a really difficult week and we performed above and beyond the call. But there was not one word spoken about, hey, you did a nice job. The only words that were spoken are, hey, we've got a new regulation that we're going to pin on you. Leaders, feedback is critical. Leaders, the ratio of positive feedback to negative feedback should be at least five or six to one in favor of positive feedback. And when you give negative feedback, you always start with a softening statement, such as, boy, Fred, you did such a super job in that area, and this, I'm not clear that you're sure, uh, clear on what we expect in this area because it doesn't seem to be that we're on the same page. So let's see if we can't figure out something to make it work a little bit better because you did such a good job, I know you can do a super job on this. And then start your critique. People will listen to you when you do that. It's like Eli, it's like a basketball game. Now the greatest scorer in the history of basketball, without question, was a guy named Will Chamberlain. He's 7'2", was built like Adonis. He scored 100 points in the game, had a season where he averaged 50 points, 50 points every game. Can you imagine? You know, somebody scores 50 points, that's like the lead story on Sports Center. He averaged 50 points a game. Averaged. Here's my point. His team won maybe one or two championships. He won one in Philadelphia, and I think he won one in Los Angeles. The Celtics were winning like 11 out of 13 championships. What's the point? The point is that the statistics that everybody sees are not, all, are not the whole deal. Each job is a critical for the success of the team. In basketball, it's not just points. It's rebounding. It's steals. It's passing. It's defense, both individual defense and team defense. It's ball control. It's chemistry, which is utilizing the strengths and not exposing the weaknesses of the team. You want to do the same thing in the workplace. And towards that end, to me, this is the most neglected part of the workplace today, is that we're not giving constant feedback. And the term feedback has a negative connotation. So I've taken some people that are clearly top people in the world and some of their quotes on feedback. Listen to these quotes. This gives you the idea of why it's so important to have feedback. Bill Gates, we all need people who will give us feedbacks. feedback. That's how we, how we improve. Frank Clark, criticism, like rain, should be gentle enough to nourish a man's growth without destroying his roots. Once again, the softening statement. Ken Blanchard, and this is the one that I use all the time. Ken Blanchard is the one that wrote The One Minute Manager and, and several books, of several best-selling books. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. Jim Trinka and Les Wallace. Feedback is a gift. Ideas are the currency of our next success. Let people see you value both feedback and ideas. So feedback's a two-way street. It's not just the leaders giving feedback to the masses, it's the masses giving feedback to the leaders and the leaders listening to it. Tim Fargo, mistakes should be examined, learned from, and discarded, not dwelled upon and stored. Okay, mistakes should be examined, learned from, and discarded, not dwelled upon and stored. This comes from 
our basic mindset that we're taught in school that the worst thing you can do is make a mistake. You failed. You're one of the dumb kids. You made a mistake. Successful people always tell you if you want to succeed more often, you need to fail more often. That's how you learn. You learn from your failures. Failure is feedback. Failure is feedback. Number six, here's an interesting one. What is the shortest word in the English language that contains the letters A, B, C, D, E, F? Answer, feedback. Don't forget that feedback is one of the essential elements of good communication. And that quote is from my very good friend, Anonymous. Robert Allen tells us, there is no failure, only feedback. That's the mindset of the successful five percenter. This one is one of the more important ones. It's very short. Write this down, red flag this one. This is from Ed Batista, and I quote, Make feedback normal, not a performance review, unquote. When you go in and you have your performance review, you sit there and you go, oh, I hope they're not going to say this, I hope they're not going to say that, you know, and then you walk out of there feeling like a person of less value. Feedback needs to be positive. When you give a child positive feedback, what does that do? It inspires, it adds fuel, it encourages. Guess what? Those same children grow up to be adults and the feedback, the positive feedback has the same results. Once again, that ratio should be at least five to one. When you go around as the leader, be a good finder. Most leaders are always looking for things that do wrong. People on the cameras are looking, oh, he did that, he did that. Be a good finder. Write down the things that people have done well and let them know you saw them. Let them know you appreciate it. Because what will that do? That will encourage them and that will encourage them to do more. In a basketball game, let me give you an example, Eli. One of the things that's important in basketball, I, I had a, a kid, his name was Kenny as a matter of fact, and he was not a particularly good shooter, he was decent size. But the thing that he could do was he would have the guts to stand in front and draw an offensive foul. Now, that shows up like about that much on the stat sheet. It doesn't show up like somebody scoring 20 points in the game. But typically when you draw that foul, it's a key point in the game, especially if you're doing it against the other team's best player. If you're stepping in, if you're taking the hit right in the chest, that takes some courage, that takes some guts. Always after the game, when we would win, everybody's in the locker room, and everybody's saying, oh, he scored 15, and he got eight rebounds, and whatever. I would always say, let's give a hand to Kenny for that outstanding offensive foul that he drew, and everybody would clap. And that kind of recognition, now, do you suppose that when I give Kenny that recognition, that encourages him to next time do it again? Does it encourage other people to say, you know what, I'm gonna stand in front and do that? Or when somebody dives on the floor for a loose ball, it's not on the stat sheet, but it could be the difference between winning and losing a game. In any business endeavor that you're pursuing, there are always little statistics, little things that make the difference in a game. Not everybody can be Will Chamberlain, but anybody can dive on the floor for a loose ball and be a team player. That's what you're looking for. You get the chemistry, you get everyone focused on the vision, and you get people just hungering to get that job done. No matter how good you think you are as a leader, my goodness, the people around you will have all kinds of ideas for how you can get better. So for me, the most fundamental thing about leadership is to have the humility to continue to get feedback and to try to get better. Because your job is to try to help everybody else get better. And that's from Jim Yong Kim. Once again, it doesn't matter how great you think you are. The people that are in the workplace always feel like, hey, I'm closer to the action. And for the most part, 
excuse me, for the most part, they're usually right. And things can be fine-tuned. How about if we try this? How about if we try that? You know, the leaders are looking for things like that. But if the only feedback you give is a once in a while negative feedback, and somebody gives you an idea and you like slough it off, like, oh, that's a valueless idea, always take their ideas under advisement. Always jot them down. And then when you hear the same idea once or twice from other different people, or even if you just think that idea is a great idea to begin with on its own merits, embrace it. And when you take somebody's idea from the rank and file, from the masses, what do you suppose that does to them right there? Do you think it gets them excited? Do you think they say, boy, this guy's listening to me. What I'm doing is important. My opinion counts. It's value. I'm part of the team. Is that the kind of organization you want to have? What? It's a bonding experience. It's a bonding experience. And number 10 is from a gentleman named Daniel Kahneman. K-A-H-N-E-M-A-N. And I quote, True intuitive expertise is learned from prolonged experience with good feedback on mistakes. Once again, expertise is learned from things that you did, things that you fine-tuned, things that you corrected. All right, that's going to be the end of part one of our discussion on leadership and how it relates to the success formula. I strongly urge you to tune in next time for part two. Uh, and now keep in mind, all of these things relate to the individual success formula. Once again, it's the job of the leader to take the individual success formula and apply it to the team and get the same principles to work. And because we will never end our meeting on a philosophical note, let's get out there and charge! I'm Eli's dad.